Hi, I'm Becca Lewis, your host for the Shift the Shuttle podcast, where we share tips and tools for making shifts in our lives from the inside out. This is the second podcast in the series called The Shift Shuttle. The first one answered more about the how, why, what, and who of the shift. It's a great place to start if you haven't heard it yet. And this one, I cover some of the basic premises of the shift and give you at least three really, really good tools you can use right now to help with any and every shift going on in your life. Originally, this series was recorded just for the shift community way back in 2008. Now, we've re-released them out into the wild, so to speak. To get this podcast ready for its new debut, I had to listen to it. And in doing so, heard many nuggets of truth and inspiration that I need to put back into my own practice. It's full of goodies, so we best get started traveling together on this shift shuttle as we shift the story together. Thank you for joining me for the next 50 minutes or so on our shift shuttle to the truth. I love the concept of shuttle. It's a short ride taking us to a specific destination. At the Honolulu airport, they call the shuttle from the airport to the baggage area the wiki wiki, which means quick, quick. It's just a short little jaunt. And during that ride, there is beautiful scenery to see and perfumed air to breathe. Whether the shift shuttle is wiki-wiki or slow and leisurely, it doesn't matter, does it? Let's just sit together for a bit on this shuttle and speak of truth. Sometimes I hear a title of a talk or an easing and know that it is the title I'm supposed to use But then I have to sit down and actually figure out what it means. That's the case with this one. Unearthing your unique self. What the heck does that mean anyway? The problem lies in the wording of your unique self, which I know for sure there is only one self. I mean, isn't that what we all have agreed? One mind knowing itself as what appears as us. This is not easy to do. Well, actually, it is easy to agree to one mind, but living it is another matter entirely. We say there is one, and then we act as if there are many. We say one provides, and yet we act as if it is our work or others that provide. We say that divine love is all, yet we seek love through material means. We know that we get lost in the word worldview and our beliefs when we don't begin with truth. We know that we can often find small truths to sustain us, but when these small truths run out or fail us, fear attempts to take up residence within our thinking. What we want to do is to dissolve our illusion of humanness and worldview and limitation and be the understanding of God itself, which is kind of like unearthing. It is coming out from the worldview, seeing and understanding as God sees and understands, remembering that understanding is a quality of God. So when we are understanding, we are God aware of itself. An unique self? What is that? I think this is even more tricky to talk about, since there is only one, and it is the unique self, so who are we? And how can we call ourself a unique self without reverting to dualistic, separatist thinking? Tricky, but let's give it a try, always remembering that in reality, the big R reality, there is only one. It's kind of like light beams. We often mistakenly use the sun and light beams as the symbol of God and us. But this symbol is faulty. 
If we think that it means that we are individual like beams, for there are, in actuality, no light beams. What appears as light beams is a mist perception. It is the dirt or imperfections in the air that make it appear as if there are beams. If we are going to use sun as a symbol of God, then it must be with the awareness that there is not division in light as there is no division in God. I don't think anyone explains this concept better than Mary Baker Eddy, so let's look at what she says about real, big R reality, and unreal identity. Quote, The divine mind maintains all identities, from a blade of grass to a star, as distinct and eternal. The questions are, what are God's identities? What is soul? Does life or soul exist in the thing formed? Nothing is real and eternal. Nothing is spirit but God and his idea. Evil has no reality. It is neither person, place, nor thing. It is simply a belief, an illusion of material sense. The identity or idea of our reality continues forever. But spirit, or the divine principle of all, is not in spirit's formations. Soul is synonymous with spirit, God, the creative, governing, infinite principle outside of finite form, which forms only reflect, unquote. Wow, think on that. One way to look at what we are talking about today is that God is self understanding itself. Our intent then is to become aware and to repent. We can become aware of what is true, become aware of what we perceive that is hiding the truth, and then repent, shift our thinking, walk the other way, see differently. And this in turn will both unearth and reveal our unique expression called us. This revelation brings freedom of life, so why would we not want it? Habit, fear, lack of faith, not understanding, so many reasons why many of us cling to the human symbol of everything, including human personalities. However, if we don't cling to the human symbol, we will discover the unbroken light. It will be so much easier to do both these steps, become aware and repent, if we use the eyes of Elias. Who was Elias? Elias was called Elijah in the Old Testament. He was the prophet who saw spiritual evidence when others saw material things. In other words, he saw everything through spiritual eyes. It was Elijah who said to the woman who thought she had nothing left in her house to eat, Fear not, go and do as thou hast said, but make me thereof a little cake first, and bring it unto me, and after make for thee and for thy son. For thus saith the Lord God of Israel, The barrel of meal shall not waste, neither shall the cruse of oil fail, until the day that the Lord sendeth rain upon the earth. And she went and did according to the saying of Elijah, and she and he and her house did eat many days, and the barrel of meal wasted not, neither did the cruse of oil fail, according to the word of the Lord, which he spake by Elijah. It was Elijah who said to the same woman when her son fell ill and was afraid, even after she had already seen the proof of God's love with the unfailing meal and oil, Give me thy son. And he took him out of her bosom and carried him up into a loft where he abode and laid him upon his own bed. And Elijah took the child and brought him down out of the chamber into the house and delivered him unto his mother. And Elijah said, See, thy son liveth. It was Elijah who said, How long halt ye between the two opinions? If the Lord be God, follow him. But if Baal, then follow him. It was Elijah who went against the prevailing belief in Baal's prophets and proved to those worshipping human gods that there is only one God. 
when he called upon God to light a fire in the middle of a pouring rain, which Baal could not do. It was a fire that burned the altar of wood and stone, a fire that even licked up the fire that was in the trench. It was Elijah who heard the still small voice that came to him after the earthquake and the fire. Elijah certainly is an example of unearthing his unique self and looking through what appears to be material and seeing it as it truly is, spiritual. Let's look at some of the ways that we can do this now, ways that we can see one when others see duality. Let's uncover some of the beliefs we have so that we can reveal what is hidden in plain sight. We could start with the idea that we have that we are separate entities called human and that we have a choice how to express ourselves. We are actually the only thing that thinks it does. The tree doesn't try to be something other than a tree or the grass or the sand or a flower. Instead of seeing ourselves as the compound idea of God, we give ourselves a separate power and that separate power actually hides our true self. We are the only thing that thinks we have a choice to not be our unique self. As we practice the shift of perception, choosing instead spiritual perception or the eyes of Elias, we don't cover up the past because if we feel we must cover it up, it would mean that we must also think it was true in the first place. We know instead that the past is just a present memory of a story we believed and sometimes still believe to be true. It is a ghost story that we allow to haunt us. As we face that false story with what is true, that there is nothing other than now, the past memory of what was and is an illusion often simply dissolves away. However, sometimes we must face what appeared as a story and intentionally dissolve it. Otherwise, it lies beneath the surface, hidden within a belief system, distorting everything in our lives. It's fairly easy to discover the hidden or unresolved belief buried in what appears as the past by noticing our lives in the now. If there is a stoppage in any area or a circling around of a story, different place, different time, but same story, if there is the feeling, I've been here before, most likely it's an unconscious or barely conscious belief that is calling the shots. One of the dangers of unearthing and uncovering the past is that we often become attached to the story in the form of guilt or shame or sorrow. This is evil's next measure of defense. It knows that once it is uncovered, sort of like turning over a rock and seeing what lurks beneath as it scrambles to its native darkness, evil knows that its deception is over. So it attaches itself to the one who uncovered it, claiming all sorts of lies. These lies usually start with the words, if only, and end with some form of, it was your fault that. Evil loves to hide, so the more we put evil under a microscope of truth, the more powerless it becomes. This is what the shift practice does. It focuses attention, like a microscope, on the truth first, and on the lie that there is another power. Not to own evil, or the lie, but to disown it. Notice I didn't say, put it under a microscope and then take it home and live with it. Del has told me a story of a man he knows who did just that. He decided to bring evil home to study it. Suffice it to say, his home life and his children suffered from this decision. So no, don't let that creepy crawly thing attach to you and claim that you have to give it a free ride. We can see evil in its aggressive forms and recognize it, but evil is also just as dangerous, perhaps more so, in its less aggressive disguise. And by this, I don't mean aggressive in terms of how much bad occurs because of it, but how visible and prominent it appears. The less noticeable forms of evil are guilt, shame, humiliation, despair, doubt, 
discouragement, and on and on. These are actually even more dangerous because we accept them as true and part of ourselves. What it is claiming is that you are human and that God does not have power in a human place and that there is a human place. All lies. Come on, there is either one omnipresent power that is good or there is one omnipresent power that is bad. Omnipresent means just one, right? It doesn't mean just one when we get to either heaven or hell. It means just one right here, right now, past, present, and future all rolled into one. So it doesn't make us a better person to see what claims to be the stupid things we did or are doing and then give it more power by wearing it as a badge of honor. Well, actually, maybe it does if we are a person because being a person is the dualistic worldview. So I guess if we want to magnify the dualistic worldview, then being a better person sounds like a great idea. This reminds me of a relative of Dell's who believes that when it's all over, when he dies, he's going to, here's his words, just be gone anyway, so who the heck cares how I behave now? Yikes, not. If you believe this too, sorry to tell you, this isn't going to happen. This belief is actually the reverse of the story that goes like this. When I die, I get to heaven. So now I need to be a good person to make it there. Whoops, not that either. There is only one, nowhere to go but here. But it is not the here that we are so clearly aware of through our five senses. It is the real here, not the dualistic material and spiritual place, but here, the one which is spiritual, the one that shines through as we dissolve our mist, mist perception. So back to that guilt, shame, blah stuff from the past. No past. No dualistic stuff to hang on to. But that does not mean that after we see what is under the rock, we simply turn the rock back over and walk away. We have to actually see through the illusion and dissolve it completely. And then the mist is less dense and truth is seen more clearly in what looks like better living conditions. We all go through times of trouble while in this illusion of believing we are human. How long we stay there, what we think about it while we are there, is entirely up to us. As we get better at this shifting, repenting stuff, turn around, walk the other way, change your thinking stuff, what used to take days, weeks, months, and years to resolve, can be resolved in seconds. Here is a little story that is helpful in remembering to not let evil attach itself to us. I used to live in downtown Los Angeles, which, by the way, I loved. I had given up my car because my office was downtown, and everything I needed was there or a short metro right away. So instead of a car, I used what I used to spend on car, gas, and insurance to take trips. One trip I took every month was a two-hour train trip from the beautiful part of downtown Los Angeles to the beautiful part of Oceanside to visit my daughter and her family in Carlsbad. So I started in beauty and ended in beauty, and most of the trip was stunningly beautiful. But right after we pulled out of the station, it got really ugly. I would stare at how ugly it was, marveling that I never saw this ugly part of Los Angeles unless I was on that train, since it was outside of my range of daily living. But to get where I wanted to go, I had to ride through ugly. This is very much like human life. There are times we travel through ugly or evil, but it can be as easy as riding through it without attachment knowing that on the other side, it is beautiful. In spiritual terms, this works even better because we don't have to ride the train back again through ugly. Actually, the truth is we are not even on a train at all. We are not human. We are spiritual. But once again, we know that as it is right now, 
all spiritual awarenesses come through symbols, and often they are encased in stories or parables. Just don't get attached to them. Look through them to see their essence and use them to shift your perception to a spiritual perception. There is a wonderful story in the Bible about Lot and his wife. Let's look at it from a symbolic stand rather than literally. Lot and his wife came from a town or a place where the people were living a very materialistic, dualistic life with little to no understanding of the truth of love. And the resulting lifestyle that brings was a standard in that town. Lot heard that still small voice that told him to leave that place, that dualistic state of mind and point of view. And he obeyed. As he left, taking his wife, he heard the guidance to not look back at that place, as that state of mind and that point of view was destroyed. And once again, he obeyed that guidance and was freed from that state of mind and point of view. Isn't this what we're talking about? Not letting evil attach itself to us, or, as it leaves, not leaving with it. Anyway, Lot managed to keep going, but his wife looked back and turned into a pillar of salt. Hello? A frozen moment of attention? A frozen focus? It's important to remember that it is the intention of evil to hold spirit down to earth or material thinking, down to the world view. It is determined that you do not know or remember who you are. It will trick you in any way that it can. And one way is to have you look back and be frozen. On the other hand, we can see something else in this story. Lot's wife turned into a pillar of salt. The word pillar and salt are often used in the Bible to describe positive aspects and as a positive symbol. In the aptly named chapter in the Bible called Exodus, the children of Israel chose to no longer be enslaved. Remember, they were the symbol of those that saw the promise of freedom and were willing to be guided away from that dualistic evil intention to enslave them to matter. Once again, quoting Mary Baker Eddy, we read, quote, They were guided triumphantly through the Red Sea, the dark, ebbing and flowing tides of human fear. As they were led through the spiritual wilderness, walking wearily through the great desert of human hopes, and anticipating the promised joy, a pillar of cloud by day and a fire by night led them, unquote. A pillar. What was a frozen moment of attention, a frozen focus, can also be a symbol of freedom, a promise of guidance. In Exodus, we read, And the Lord went before them, by day and a pillar of cloud to lead them the way, and by night and a pillar of fire to give them light to go by day and night. As for salt, Jesus said, Ye are the salt of the earth, a city set on the hill. So the very thing that Lot's wife became, a frozen pillar of salt, could be transformed, seen again as a guiding light out of the wilderness and as an inspiration to others. But there is a difference between being a symbol of freedom and inspiration and trying to make someone follow you or listen to you. Have you ever tried to have a discussion with someone about a book you had read or a controversial subject you were studying who had never read the book or had the slightest understanding of the subject? Of course, we would have to ask ourselves why we would want to have the discussion with someone. Are we trying to fix them, get them on our side, make them like us? All good questions. Have we ever done that for any of these reasons? I know I have. This rarely works out. This is the same thing as having a discussion about your understanding of God after doing lots of study and practice and becoming aware of the true nature of God and trying to convince someone of the truth that has become so clear to you. 
with someone who has never read the book or become a student of the truth. Give it up. Pay attention to your own spiritual work. Ask those you wish to have as part of your spiritual community to begin to read the same books. Do the same study as you are doing so you can have an equal conversation. You can be an environment in which they can see their true spiritual nature. You can be a pillar of cloud and fire so they can see the way. Doing this, it won't be about you trying to convince them for whatever good reason you have. It will be their own decision to join you or not. One of my favorite quotes, and most likely you will hear it again from me over and over, is what Jesus said to his disciple Peter as he worried about a disciple who is lagging behind. Jesus saith unto him, If I will that he tarry till I come, what is that to thee? Follow thou me. Or, more simply, what is that to you? Follow thou me. Follow truth. They will either follow the same path as you or not. But what is that to you? This is a multi-meaning question. Later, Jesus commanded, Follow me and let the dead bury their dead. In other words, let the world and its point of view be less and less important to you. Be who you are unearth your unique self. Love truth more than popularity, pride, and being comfortable. Let's do some more unearthing. I mean this both ways. Let's unearth those beliefs and let's unearth ourselves and claim our spiritual identity. All of us have a worldview life statement that we habitually say to ourselves without being aware of it. You can get attuned to hearing it by listening first to other people talk. What reasons do they use to not do things? Or why things are not going well? Or why they are not willing? There are really not very many of these worldview life statements, which is not surprising since we've all been trained very carefully to think from limitation and lack. Once you hear others, you will also be able to hear your own. Listen to what you say to someone then when they ask you why you can't do something. What's the reason? Whatever the statement is, we want to reverse it and replace it with a true statement. But we don't want to overlay a true statement on top of garbage thinking. This action is often called positive thinking, not us. We want to clear out the room and throw away false thinking. One way to do this is to ask ourselves questions, to become aware of what is running our thinking and our perception, and therefore our life without our conscious consent and awareness. I developed four questions that help this process, and later I topped it off with a fifth question. So let's go through them and see how they might relate to your life and how you can apply them to become more aware. First question, are you running? Remember as you ask yourself these questions that they are not going to have right and wrong answers, but only a resulting awareness. Although are you running sounds as if you might not want to be, there are times that running is appropriate. The issue is, do you know when you are, and why you are. The funny thing about these questions is that often we will find that we do both sides of the issue at the same time. For example, in the morning, I may have two desires. One is to go for a walk or work out before I sit at my computer for the day's work. I may also have an equally strong desire to not go for a walk or work out before I sit at my computer. Since the not to do is easier than the to do, I most often do not go for a walk or work out before I sit at my computer for the day's work. Which one is running? 
I've noticed in the coaching work that we do that when we ask something from our clients that forces them to pay attention to themselves, that the first response is to run or hide. This is not them running and hiding. It is the counterfeit them that is hiding the truth of their unique self that is running and hiding so that it doesn't have to die or dissolve. Which brings me to the second question. Are you hiding? For most of us, the answer is absolutely. The funny thing about this hiding is that it's very much like a child who puts his hands over his eyes and assumes that no one can see him. Everyone knows that it is so much easier to see another person's faults than our own. Everything about ourselves is wide open. So, of course, someone else is looking right at us and seeing what we are so desperately trying to hide from. The third question, are you lying? When we tell the truth to ourselves, we are released from whatever is bothering us. Truth, of course, is an absolute, only one. But as we unearth ourselves, the truth is the closest we can get to what the still, small voice is leading us to say and do. We have a distant relative in our family that people feel obligated to visit. She's elderly and not feeling well, but she lives in a very nice place and is well taken care of. However, to visit her is to fight hard to not sink into the morose that she lives within herself. So she is not visited often, even by those that love her. This woman has been lying to herself and others all her life. She was never alone. She was never unloved. But she chose to tell herself that she was and to play the role of the victim. And now she is no longer aware that she is lying and that lie that she has told has become her life. So you can see that asking yourself, am I lying, is a very valuable exercise. The fourth question, are you waiting? This is such an important question, and even more so if you are a woman. Why? Because as a woman, we have been trained to wait. It is the reverse of the wonderful God quality of patience. How often does this waiting happen? We wait for the children in our life to grow up, the men in our lives to be okay with who we are, the money to arrive, the home to be beautiful, our weight to be perfect, our face to be unlined. I can go on and on, can't I? Patience, on the other hand, waits for the optimum moment when all aspects align, when the bud unfolds, the acorn sprouts, and the harvest is ripe. Waiting as a human never works. Well, actually, does anything as a human work? To uncover if it is waiting or patience, here is a question you could ask yourself. Am I waiting for guidance from the still small voice? Great. If I am waiting for a human condition to be present, unearth yourself. Here is the last question. Ask yourself. What would spirit do? Or, what would the unearth, unique self that I am do? In other words, how will I know what action to take and when? Let me give you a little tool that will help. It's a six-step shift to action tool. First, make a list of all the little and big things that you have been putting off doing. Don't make this list significant. Don't think too hard and use your intelligence to make the list. Use, instead, your aware feelings and make the list without judgment, fear, or worry. It's just a list. Take the items on this list through the next five steps. Once again, it doesn't matter how big or little the item is. It could be as simple as you keep putting off replacing a light bulb. Start simple. First, ask yourself, am I willing? This first step is the most crucial step of all. If you are not willing, 
You won't. Notice what you are not willing to do and head to the next step. If you are willing, go do it. Now. Stop listening. Go replace the light bulb. Seriously. Do something you are willing to do. Something easy. Then come back to another item on the list. Step 2. For those things you are not willing to do, make another list. Sometimes the things on this list show you that you were right about not being willing. Perhaps it would involve doing things that do not feel morally correct to you. Great! Cross that item off the list and move on. Step 3. Now for those things on your list that you're not willing to do but really want to do. Take each item and write yourself a note over and over again. Write this. I choose to be willing to do. Write out what it is that you're willing to do. So it might be, I choose to be willing to change the light bulbs. Exactly how you can do this can be found in my book, Living in Grace, in Chapter 8, under Choose Consciously. Keep going until you have nothing more that comes up for you. This may take a while, pages sometimes. Along the way, you may discover that, once again, you really don't want to do this thing for good reasons. Cross it off. Otherwise, move to the next step. Step 4. Listen. Starting with a correct premise of who you are and knowing that reality is unconditional love and that you are never separated from God, you can put the list down and simply listen for what to do next. It may not be related. It may be to sit down and watch the sunrise. If you start with the correct premise, the action will eventually lead you to what you wanted in the first place, or the desire for it will dissolve. Step 5. Let go and celebrate. If you let go of wanting the result of your action to be how you think it should happen, or what it will look like, it will appear in a much higher form than you could have made up for yourself. You were never in charge in the first place. Let's stop fooling ourselves and making life hard when that is not necessary. Give up and let God. Celebrate this fact with unending gratitude. Be willing to be moved by innumerable angel ideas. Let's review how we can replace the memories of the past to align with truth using the felt imagine tool. Here's an example. When I was young, my dad taught me how to be frugal. I knew how much money my allowance was and how much money he would give me each season for new clothes. If I wanted more, and I did, I had to work for it. I babysat for extra cash and I made my own clothes. Recently, I was practicing felt imagining and had an interesting revelation. Instead of seeing my dad handing out just enough, which is what I have experienced most of my life, just enough and seasonal, I imagined seeing my loving father, and this is what my dad was trying to be, shoveling money at me. I saw and felt him dumping money into every open box in my room and filling my checking account with many zeros. He kept saying, Here's more. As I imagined the scenario, I thought of a very wealthy friend of mine. He told me his dad taught him how to invest money and how money works in the market. He never, ever found money to be seasonal or just enough. Different training, different belief system, different outcome, or signs following. My dad, out of love, taught me to survive. His dad, out of love, taught him how to handle abundance. For both of our families, there was a long history of both styles. That doesn't make it real. Remember, the past is our present memory of an illusion, and our present is the outcome of that memory. 
Now that I see this belief and how pervasive it has been, I can reimagine using felt imagining a different past. This time, instead of an imperfect past, I am imagining a perfect now. This time, my father is teaching me how to handle abundance. And wow, that feels different. While we are talking about money, let's talk briefly about the subject of thinking that our work provides. In a sense, our work does provide. When our work is the outgrowth of the perception that one is all, then the action called work is the provision that love provides. The perception of the thing is the thing. Once again, if we turn to the Bible, we can find the ultimate direction for what action to take. Seek ye first the kingdom of God, and all these things will be added unto thee. From this passage, we would deduce that if we seek first the kingdom of God, everything that we need will be provided. How could we live this within our daily lives, within the context of work? Here is one way. We can look at how we spend our money that we work for and reverse it back to why we spend it that way. Analyzing it this way, we could see what we are really trying to do when we work for money. Once we do this, it's just one simple shift away to become aware if we are actually fulfilling our intention or living someone else's intention for our life. To simplify this exercise, let's narrow down the reason we work to four primary motivators, or actually qualities, love, security, prestige or power, and freedom. We all desire all four of these qualities. However, each one of us is motivated by one more than the other. I do have a worksheet that you can use to determine the answer to this question. In the last few pages of my book, Living in Grace, The Shift to Spiritual Perception, take the time to go through this exercise. You may be surprised. I was. Whichever answer is revealed to you, be sure to bring it back to the qualities that it represents and not the things. Remember, it isn't our job, our work, or our gifts that bring us income. They are the income. Our clients are not our profit or our income. They are our awareness of God present as clients. If we keep looking at the thing to bring us what we want, we will be searching without end or digging one well after another. When one idea runs out, we dig a well for another. Sooner or later, we will get tired of all this digging and looking. Jesus said, If you drink from the water from this well, you will never be thirsty. Well, what well is that? It's the well of understanding of the truth of who we are. Instead of taking time to learn this, we take more time and effort to dig another well. If we don't find the money or love we need from one, then digging another is the next thing to do. Or so the world view, based in fear, would have us believe. Why not drink from the well that never runs out? the one that never leaves us thirsty. So many of us have seen that well and then wandered off following the siren call of duality thinking. It tempts us with pleasures and personal victories and acquisitions. Temptation is not the problem. The problem is continuing to listen to and follow it. The sirens of legend are now the constant barrage of lies we see, hear, taste, and feel projected onto and into every crevice of our daily lives. The truth is, we love because we are the love of love. We are the action of love-loving. If we love to prove love, then we are lost in the small truth and the well that can only sustain us until it runs dry. If we believe that our customers, clients, stocks, business, paycheck, charity, our parents are the source of our provision, we are lost in that valley of confusion. 
if we shift our perception and action back to the awareness that what appears as customers, clients, stocks, business, paycheck, charity, or parents is divine love providing for itself, then we rise above the confusion into the clarity of understanding. If we perceive money as an object that must be acquired, then we are lost in the curse of working for a living. If we shift our perception and our actions to the awareness that money is God in action, then we are freed from that curse. We can seek refuge from this siren call and the temptations in the truth of who we are. We are the unique expression of the infinite in action. On the big island of Hawaii, there is a lovely place called the City of Refuge. In ancient times, if you violated a sacred taboo, you were sentenced to death. Breaking a taboo was believed to incur the wrath of the gods and carried with it that sentence of death. However, if you could reach a place of refuge, you were safe. After being purified, you could return safely home. Get there. Not to Hawaii, but to the place of refuge called divine love. Get to that perception and then stay in it while returning to action. As we unearth, we are escaping the binding sense of being human and the world view of lack and fear. It has no reality than what we have given it. As we unearth ourselves, the uniqueness of what we are becomes like the perfume of a flower. It is not something we do, but something that is. We are not the light beams of divine love. We are love and life itself, seen in every aspect of what appears as our life. We are the light. We can continually ask ourselves, are my perceptions and my actions beginning from the reality of one? If we are, we have unearthed ourselves and we see ourselves as each other, as one and unique. Because unique is a quality of infinity and the infinite. Thank you for riding with me on the shift shuttle as we unearth our unique self. It was pure pleasure. In this podcast, I talked about the four questions. A few years after this podcast was recorded, following multiple requests to do so, I wrote a book all about those four questions and how to use them. It's called The Four Essential Questions, Choosing Spiritually Healthy Habits. Also, I mentioned there was a money worksheet at the end of the book, Living in Grace. However, the new editions of the book no longer have that worksheet, but I do have a PDF version of it that you can download for free. You can find the link to the books and the worksheets at theshift.com slash podcast. May I ask for your help? When you listen to this podcast on iTunes or Stitcher, would you rate it and leave a review and or comment on the post? It takes just a few minutes, and yet it is such a huge help to me. Thank you to everyone who has taken the time to share these podcasts. You are a stupendous group of shifters. Here's your shift hack. It was right there at the end of the podcast. Ask yourself this. Are my perceptions and my actions beginning from the reality of one? I'll be asking myself that too. Till next time, let's keep shifting the story together. Mm-hmm.